Thank you for choosing to listen to this podcast from ABF, The Soldiers Charity. I'm Lorraine Kelly. The Soldiers Charity is 75 years old this year and this series of podcasts is our way of sharing a few of the stories of some of the people it helps. Today, I'll be introducing you to two people whose lives were changed forever by war and conflict and finding out how they've adapted to their new circumstances. Bob Semple is a veteran of the Royal Engineers. After leaving the army, he became a civilian engineer and his work regularly took him to the Middle East. Bob was working in Yemen in 2014 when he was ambushed and captured by Al-Qaeda. He was held as hostage in solitary confinement for the next 18 months, chained to the wall of a windowless cell. They would drag you out to do a a video. They'd hold a sheet up so they couldn't see behind you. The shot was just of you with a sheet. We want you to beg for your life. And then one of them was to the Omani government. Another one was to the Saudi government. And they wanted $10 million. We're also going to hear from Sarah Adams. Sarah's son James was serving with the 2nd Royal Welsh in Afghanistan when a Taliban bomb exploded under his vehicle. He died, aged just 21. Sometimes I still think I'm back in the 27th of September 2009. you just got to be strong and find something that's important. And for me, that's my family, making sure James is not forgotten. I want James to be proud of me. I don't want James to think that I've given up. Since losing James, Sarah and her family have undertaken countless activities on behalf of ABF, the soldiers' charity, raising tens of thousands of pounds. And in 2014, Sarah received the Soldiering Own Families Award. The conversation you'll hear is about loss and grief, but it's also about hope, resilience and moving forward with life. Here are Bob and Sarah speaking to Dave Roberts. Bob, you were held hostage for 18 months. Yeah. While you were there, you had no idea what was going on in at home. You were completely no. isolated from... Totally. How did you manage to tick off the time? The first fortnight, my brain was still not functioning because I'd been beaten over the head with pistol whipped and that. I'd kept record of the date so that I knew what date... Because you see them on the, on the telly, you know, the all these prisoners and that marking off on the wall and things like that. Well, you've got nothing to mark with. Not in my cell, anyway. So I thought, well, I must make an actual physical effort to remember the date. And so I kept the date in my head. And I was lying on the floor and I thought, shit, I booked to go home on the 22nd of February. I'd upgraded the Dubai to the London one because I wanted to go upstairs in the A380. And I thought, bloody hell, I'm going to lose all those bloody air miles. <laughs> And then I realised that I was going to lose a lot more than air miles. The first thing I did then was I put my family totally out of my mind, all my friends, everybody, and it was just me on my own. And that was it. That's how I coped. Just me. So do you and Sally ever discuss the possibilities of you being in a, a conflict zone, working as a civilian, and the dangers of that? No. Did you ever have any plans, what you would do if something like that happened? No, not really. Never went there. Yeah, it was just a job. OK, it was a bit ropey at times. That was it. James wouldn't have um, that conversation. He was quite guarded with everything and a little bit flippant. So there was never any real conversation about it at all. I tried asking questions. I tried. I watched anything I could about Afghanistan. But he literally was not going to have that conversation. I think... From what I've been told afterwards, he was always trying to protect me from the realities of things. But I'm, I am I like to know what's going on. I'm better if I know what's happening. So I, I tried every way I could to find out about it. So you had no plans in place for how, how life would be coped with if, if the worst happened? No, no. James had had conversations with his friends because I had that information afterwards. But in my head, all I kept thinking was I will not, if anything happens, I'll... I will not cope with anything will happen to him. You know, he had the conversation because not long after we lost James, um, one of his friends came and said that they'd had the conversation about funeral songs because his friend had lost their dad. And James had apparently said, if anything happens to me, 
I want to be cremated and the song I want at my cremation would be Nelly, It's Getting Hot in Here. We did honour that. <laughs> so after you'd James had died and you'd been through the initial period, you threw yourself into being active and being active with ABF, the Soldiers Charity and and elsewhere. What was your kind of motivation for becoming a, a, an incredible fundraiser and advocate? Initially, to keep James's memory alive, and still is actually my biggest fear that he'd be forgotten. I don't think our government cherish our armed forces enough, even the ones that we have still. But about four days after James was killed, we had his pay slip. And for four weeks in Afghanistan, it was £1,294. And not at one point do I think that it's all about money. I know why soldiers go and do what they do. But that is absolutely horrendous for the for, for what they're doing. So we were campaigning for better treatment with the government. And then we decided that, you know, we wanted to help the soldiers that the government were not helping. And it was ABF that we chose. So when people often talk about the army family yeah. uh, as being something that is beyond just a serving uh, a soldier, uh, how how's that? How do you reflect upon that? How's how's that uh, family worked in in your case? Because you you've been a civilian for a number of years before yeah, you. Yeah, I've been a civvy for about twenty odd years. I mean, s- since I got back, I opened up a Facebook page. I think I've got about five hundred ex squaddies as friends. It's just brilliant. The banter's just ace. When I was in in the army, it was magic. I just loved it to bits. I wanted to be a soldier uh, from day one, really. And I became a Royal Engineer. I was all over the world, did Northern Ireland, did the Falklands. And it is just it is exactly what they say, a band of brothers. I know that, for me, um, James loved his very short time, sadly, in the army. And I know he was proud of it. And I didn't want to lose that connection. It is, you know, a family and I really feel like I need that in my life. I see the impact they've had on other people's lives and for me to be able to keep that in our life for James's memory is absolutely priceless. The British Army, packed full of uh, men and women of, you know, steel and character, but one of their weaknesses maybe is the fact that they don't talk and they don't share, would that be a fair assessment or would that be no. uh, an unfair assessment? That's an unfair assessment. Squaddies tend to look after their own. What happened to me was when, when I got back, to say I was traumatised, as you know, I definitely was. And my mate, Simo, he used to be a captain of a boat and he invited me up to Warminster to have lunch with him. And he brought his son, who at the time was a, a major in the army, and his idea was I could talk to another squaddy, even though it was an officer, yeah, and I was just a sergeant when I left. And it was, it was the beginning of healing. And that's how squaddies get over it. They all chat with each other. So if you're out on a job and there's an incident in Northern Ireland, stuff like that, when you come back to camp, you sit and talk about it. And so we do talk about stuff. And yeah, we talk about the important stuff, like what happens if I get shot? And in Northern Ireland, we used to have this uh, tap your wallet because it was get the wallet because we're having to piss up in the bar tonight if somebody gets shot. <sighs> That's how it used to work. I've always found it a little bit institutionalised, I think. But then I'm not in the army. I'm not a squaddy, so I'm not going to have that same rapport. And my James didn't obviously talk to me. I know he talked to his mates. I know that. And I've had that recollection from them. For me, I've not been great at, at talking about it other than being able to talk about James in this way. I don't talk about how, very often, how I feel about it because I don't really... I feel that's just really awkward for me. I find it difficult. I try to just keep strong for my daughter and my younger son and my grandsons and my family. Do they think that civilians, yourself as a civilian, actually understand the support and the help that serving and former soldiers and their families actually need? I don't think there's enough. I don't think the government are doing enough to help bereaved families, veterans, are serving soldiers. I, I, I think that's lacking. It does seem to me that it's always down to charity stepping in where they're failing. NHS are not able to, to cover it all. Um, and I think much more needs to be done, without a doubt. Yeah, and 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 a loss of a bereaved for bereaved families that have lost somebody that's served, you know, in that traumatic way, or 
families that are dealing with veterans um, with PTSD. Um, I think there isn't enough that civilians are doing and knowing about it to be able to help properly. So then it still becomes a little bit institutionalised because it's all done within the forces itself. PTSD is, uh, every squaddy suffers from it, believe it or not. Yeah, If you've been in trauma, you suffer from it, even if you don't think you do. Mm. Do you think that when you came back to the UK, people understood? No, I went to my GP and he said, you may need help, you may need counselling. I said, yeah, OK then. He says, you'll not get it on the NHS. He says, if you were a serial killer or something like that, they might be interested in you. My youngest son, Josh, I mean, he, I think he really struggled. Um, he was only 15 and it was just him and I in the house when the door knocked and obviously he can hear what they're telling me and all I can remember hearing is him crying in the back room. But any help that was offered for him was antidepressants. Yeah. Uh, you know, that we're not depressed, is I'm it? not depressed. Sad, and he, you know, he was 15 dealing with everything a 15-year-old goes through on the loss of his brother and possibly the loss of me for a little while because life was just yeah. a mess. Yeah, my, my youngest one went through that. Yeah. He, when I got back, he was uh, self-harming on antidepressants. Yeah, and pff, he's 20 now, so hopefully he's got out of it. So there was something more than sympathy that you, you felt that your family and yourselves and the individuals, both of you, needed more than just sympathy. Oh, I know, I didn't want sympathy, empathy, and an understanding of it and, and help for, not so much me, because I think I was an automatic pilot. I was just, we've got to keep going, I've got to look after the kids, I've got to make sure no one forgets James you know and it was so so important to me and that and that's how it was and you know I think I I came back to it a little bit about five years in and and realized lots of shocking things then but no it's not sympathy it's it's definitely understanding it's more emotional help that is needed and there's not enough of that yeah it's difficult to explain you know when I first got back I would come down the stairs in the morning the wife was on her way to work and she'd say I've got the washing in the washing machine. When it finishes, hang it on the line. And she went out the door, and then three seconds later she came back in, and it was six o'clock at night, because I'd been used to dissolving days into no time at all. I needed help then, but there was none available. Terry Waite had a psychiatrist uh, look at me, and the psychiatrist said, you're as sane as I am, so I thought, my God, there's lots wrong with me. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, I only thing was was Simo taking me to see his son and that was when I connected back to the army and then it started to open up again mm, you know sympathy isn't it that's almost a little bit patronizing isn't yeah. it you don't want them feeling sorry for you but right. it is such a shame and even you know it was 2009 for James and we're you know 10 years on this year and there's still little has changed with help so you've both coped in your own ways with what you've been through how have you done that how have you how have you managed to take life forward sometimes i still think i'm back in the 27th of september 2009 you just got to be strong and find something that's important and for me that's my family making sure james is not forgotten i want james to be proud of me i don't want james to think that i've given up because he wouldn't give up i think that's what keeps me going well, me, I'm still sorting myself out. Yeah, it um, don't go away just like that. And you have good days, you have bad days, good nights, bad nights. I just uh, think there's people worse off than me. At least I'm back here, and this is a bonus. Yeah, I think probably for both of us it's a work in progress. Yeah, I exactly. think it will be until I am with James again, I would think. It just it completely changes you. Perspective of everything, it just completely changes you. We talked a little bit earlier about the impact that the events that you both experienced have on the wider family, or your family. Bob, if you just take us through the impact that your experiences had on your family when you returned and how you saw that, what did that look like upon return? I went through a fortnight debrief. During that period, we actually moved house. And at the same time, I turned 65, retirement, old age pension, all that all kicked in at the same time. I was very resentful for a while that these guys had robbed me of two years of my last two years working but now it's in the past not really interested in al-qaeda or anybody like that don't watch war movies because i get upset about them especially if there's kidnapping involved 
Sally, well, she's very much to herself. She's a palliative care nurse, so she deals with dying people every day. And she seems to be very together. She's my rock at the moment. So uh, I think everybody's fine. I'm, I'm hoping that Ben's going to be okay. Just got to get him employed. Once we get him going, I think um, we're now holding him back. Other than that, I mean, I can't thank the ABF enough. That's why I come. Every time they ask me to do something, I'll do it. And it's people like you yeah, that um, raise all these funds and that are just uh, amazing people. Well, it's a very important charity. I mean, it, it's helped me in ways that they probably don't understand. But it does yeah. really, really help me. Yeah, the same. I mean, even when they say, oh, oh we're, we're having a do, can you come along and mm. have a chat with the people? And you go along and uh, I, I talk to, and I get this lump in my throat every time. You know, um, when I have to talk about it. Yeah. Some people do say, does it make it harder for you to constantly be keeping to go over what's happened to James? And it, no, it's not easy. It's not easy talking about it. But it's so, so important. Keeping James's memory alive, as well as raising huge awareness for this charity that does so much for others. I mean, they asked me to go down to Sears, uh, which is a course they hold in it's about escape and evasion and stuff like that and how to cope with uh, incarceration and that. I think I talked for about half an hour just to give them an insight. And mm-hmm. so if they can glean anything from that, yeah, yeah, and it helps somebody in the future, then brilliant. So, Bob, Sally, your wife and your family were beneficiaries of ABF Soldiers Charity. Yep. Can you explain how ABF Soldiers Charity helped? Sal was working full-time. We got three boys... One had, was going through his A-levels. The other one had left school. The other one was going through his O-levels. And she was working flat out. No funds coming in from uh, my employer because obviously I was not working. <laughs> I was kidnapped. The the ABF went and saw Sal and asked her to, uh, what she needed. And Sal said, really, the house is just too much for us. It's too big with not enough funds. We need to sell this. And there was a shortfall of about £20,000. So the ABF stumped that up. We sold the house, or Sally sold the house, and then bought a smaller property. And since then, they've been brilliant. They've invited us to loads and loads of things, which has sort of put my head into gear again, which it wasn't when I got back. ABF Soldier Charity have invited you to do a number of things, and you you attended... uh the big curry, yeah. Uh, the big curry lunch that the ABF Soldiers Charity does. Yeah. Tell me how that felt when you were t- talking to uh, other veterans from from the army. We mingled around to start with, and then it was form up in a sort of orderly queue. All these vets were there with their arms and legs and you know bits missing. I said to them, I said, "Boys, I said I feel like a complete and utter fraud here." And they went, "No, no, you're our hero," and they were genuine about that, you know. And I've met loads of them since, and they're just brilliant people, absolutely. So uh, how does it how does it make you guys feel when you hear people complaining about whatever it is they might be feeling? Yeah. I mean, we all understand that you get upset when you can't make something on time and you can't make your train or something's late like that. But, God, there's a life out there. Just, you know, live it. That's that's the whole thing, is you, you get that chance. <laughs> I mean, basically, I was dead and buried and I'm back now and so I'm making the most of it believe me yeah I, I mean yeah we all moan we do we all moan but I mean when it's persistent and it, and it's really trivial you know yeah I'm not great with that at all cherish what you've got you know think how lucky you are that you're here you're healthy um, you've got your family for people listening to this podcast um, what would you like them to take away for me it's again the not forgetting every single one of us owe a debt of gratitude to our armed forces, to our soldiers, veterans and bereaved families because it's just so important what has been given up for them to have the life that they have. So I think we should all have some responsibility in helping in some way and if they can help ABF help others, then that's that's what they should do. Um, Just take that forward in your life every day and think how lucky we are because some of us aren't so lucky. If anything, just that vets, people who are in the army, if they can take away that uh, there is somebody there that can help you, which is the ABF, and don't be frightened to go and see them. 
You've been listening to Bob Semple and Sarah Adams speaking with Dave Roberts from the Soldiers Charity. We'd like to thank Bob and Sarah for taking part and for talking so candidly. Please do check out the rest of the podcasts in this series as every episode has people whose stories deserve to be heard. If you'd like to know more about ABF, the Soldiers' Charity, in this, its 75th year, then just visit soldierscharity.org where you'll find everything you need. I'm Lorraine Kelly. Thank you for listening and thank you for your support.